live from the District of Columbia. You are listening to the Black Fundraisers Podcast, a weekly podcast that celebrates, inspires, and equips black fundraisers to excel and positively impact black communities with your host, Kia Kroon. Good day, good people. Kia Kroon here, and I'm your host of the 100 Black Fundraisers Strat Talks, your weekly podcast that celebrates, inspires, and equips Black fundraisers to positively impact Black communities. As always, I appreciate you for tuning in. And I want you to know that it's my pleasure to bring you thought-provoking conversations and content that can support you in your professional and personal journey each and every week. So I really appreciate you listening with me. Good people, today we're talking about Black philanthropy. I think you'll agree, I can make this statement with with confidence, and there's evidence to support this, that Blacks are not the conventional face of philanthropy. Yet, we contribute at least $11 billion to charity each year. $11 billion. The Black community is incredibly altruistic. It's in our heritage. It's in our DNA, from passing the collection bowl or basket at church to the wealthy philanthropists we see making huge charitable gifts like Oprah and Robert F. Smith. The Black community is deeply, deeply committed to taking care of people. According to the Ford Foundation, Black donors give some of the highest percentages of their incomes to philanthropic causes compared to other racial groups. According to Ford, our spirit of giving is rooted in family, community, and our shared humanity. And as I'm sitting here talking with you, I'm reminded of something. And I gotta tell you, man, I don't wanna go to church on y'all, but In this moment, I'm reminded of the widow's offering in the Bible. And I remember it's in Mark. I can't remember exactly where, but the word talks about the poor widow who went to the temple of treasury and gave her two small coins. So she put her two coins, you know, in the collection basket, collection plate, whatever you want to call it. Meanwhile, the rich and wealthy were throwing in large amounts of money. And Jesus said, the widower gave more than all the others who gave out of their wealth because she gave out of poverty. She gave her last, essentially all that she had to live on. And I would submit to you that the widow's sacrifice is really the embodiment of the Black community's approach to philanthropy. That's what I hear the Ford Foundation saying when they say that Blacks give the highest percentages um, compared to that of other groups. Um, Because I know ordinary people who are giving for the greater good in the Black community, and they aren't necessarily high net worth people, but ordinary people doing extraordinary things and affecting change in meaningful ways, right? Philanthropy is a tradition in the Black community. And this goes back, there's evidence of this. There's evidence that our West African ancestors brought with them cultures of sharing and giving. Consider those enslaved Africans in Richmond, Virginia, who in 1847 pooled their monies and donated through their church to support famine relief, to create a famine relief fund. And in churches and families, the willingness to take up a collection in a heartbeat to help people in need, these are ordinary examples of philanthropy, ordinary examples of people giving. And don't even get me started talking about Black women and our legacy of giving. We have evidence of Madam C.J. Walker's philanthropy and the many ordinary unsung black women 
who give generously through their churches, social clubs, sororities, and giving circles, groups of people who are pooling ordinary money to support nonprofits collectively. And of course, I can't dare leave my brothers out. And I'm reminded of Colonel John McKee, who was born into freedom in Alexandria, Virginia, sometime around 1819 and ended up becoming indentured as a youth, his legacy and his commitment to helping young men without fathers go to college, which continues even today, more than a century after his passing. McKee ran a Philadelphia restaurant in his 20s and over time acquired significant amounts of property. And he would go on to provide housing for black migrants who were traveling north to Philadelphia after emancipation. When Colonel McKee died, he left his $2 million fortune to the Catholic Church and to a school that functioned for the purpose of educating orphan boys. My people are incredibly altruistic and philanthropic as evidenced by these few examples that I've provided and countless examples that we've all seen, countless examples of how the black community has leveraged philanthropy to bring about social change. So I'm challenging people listening. I'm challenging everyone to lift up wonderful stories about Blacks in philanthropy from the Robert F. Smiths of the world to ordinary Black men, women, boys, and girls giving to affect social change in their community. So today, y'all, I've got another dope sister dropping by the Black Fundraisers podcast. Her name is Joy Webb, and she's the founder of Circle of Joy Giving Circle which strategically invests in improving outcomes for Metro Atlanta youth. Joy is also the program director for the Community Investment Network, a national network of giving circles leveraging their investments to address social issues. She's dropping by to talk to us about the work of the Community Investment Network, Circle of Joy, and also to debunk some myths about Blacks in philanthropy. Joy's also got a resource to share with you good people listening. I'm not going to share it or spoil the surprise, but she's got some resources that she wants to share with Black-led nonprofits through the Community Investment Network and Microsoft. So without further ado, let's get into it. Joy, welcome to the Black Fundraisers podcast from good old Georgia. How are you? I am doing well. Thank you for asking. I'm glad. I'm delighted to have you. And I want you to know that I, along with um, many other Black women, Black brothers, are really holding space for you all in Georgia, fighting this good fight, just sending positive vibes and support to you. And thanks for what you do. Thank you. Thank you very much. We're working hard here. A lot of Black women standing up and uh, being accountable and holding others accountable. So it is, it is a continual fight. A continual fight, and they got just the ones to do it. They we, do, they do. We never scared, like, phone crusher. I don't know if folks remember. See, because I have history in Atlanta going to the Clark Atlanta University so I remember that old song by Bone Crusher. And I remember when Mayor Shirley Franklin actually quoted Bone Crusher <laughs> back in the day. She was an another fierce sister out of Georgia. She, was. she is. She still is. Yeah. I think that it's important to debunk myths about Blacks in philanthropy and this whole movement and some of the wonderful work that we're doing. So without any further ado... I want to jump right into it. I'm curious about your background in particular. How did you get into philanthropy? So it's a really interesting story. And I guess it's probably in my core. My parents were, were both educators and they always were giving back to their community. And so, you know, between Girl Scouts and volunteering, I grew up with that in my in my core, in my family, seeing it. And then essentially 
doing it as well. On this path, on this particular journey, what I'm most passionate about is giving circles. And so that was a different avenue into philanthropy. I literally was volunteering for Atlanta Public Schools, met someone who was talking about giving circles in his community in Raleigh, Durham, North Carolina. And I thought, hey, I could do that. He said it was a very simple concept that we have been doing forever in our Black communities with um, giving our time, talent, and treasure and being strategic in our collective giving, which we've always done. And I thought that is such a easy way to look at it. Philanthropy is the love of mankind. So I thought this was a great avenue to do it. I was excited to do it with people that wanted to do it, had the same cause. We were all had a common interest. So I would say about 13, 14 years ago, I introduced to the Giving Circle model and I literally jumped right in. Um, and from there have been connected in various ways since. So that's how I got into philanthropy as I know it. At one point I was struggling to say the word and now it rolls off my tongue because it's just a part of me and who I am. Yes, and I love that. And we need so much more of that. I would like to learn a little bit more about you in the Community Investment Network. Talk to us a little bit about that. So the Community Investment Network is a national network of giving circles of people of color, um, African-Americans and people of color, where we strategically, um, intentionally and collectively give back our time, talent and treasure, which leads to a testimony, um, both on our end and the grantee or partner, as we like to call it, because we all are in this together and we all can go forward together. This network has been in, in existence since, um, well, for 16 years. And like I said, it started in Raleigh, Durham by uh, a young man named Daryl Lester, who essentially was working in institutionalized philanthropy and thought, hey, I can um, do more with my people and I need to actually be able to showcase my people, African-Americans actually giving back because we are philanthropists. We've been doing it forever from days in Africa where we had to come together to make things happen. As you went to Clark, I know your motto is find a way or make one. Us as a people have always done that. A lot of times we look at African-Americans and we don't think of philanthropists. We think of old white men, essentially, writing big checks. I mean, that's kind of what you look, look at or big families that have a lot of money. Um, even today's times, you think about Gates. But we as a collective can, can be very impactful to our communities. We also are very much connected to our communities, whether that means where you're from, what college you're at, what community you're in now, the church that you go to, a uh, community looks different, but we can be involved in several different ways. And by using and leveraging our time, talent, and treasure and our resources, we're able to be impactful um, in so many ways. And it's not always about the treasure. That is a piece of it. The time, the talent, the efforts, and the community uh, building is also part of that. So it really is a group of ordinary people doing extraordinary things for their community to give back, uplift, strengthen, and watch their community thrive and walk in hand together as partners, not looking at it like, hey, I'm a, you're a grantee and I'm giving back to you. A lot of times in institutionalized philanthropy in the white norm society, you look at it as here's a check, make good with it. Um, we want to be hand in hand. We will, we circles we have 22 circles throughout our network right now and we are growing um because each community has its own purpose each uh giving circle does its own thing i actually have a giving circle in atlanta georgia called the circle of joy and we focus on youth in atlanta um, partnering with organizations that are helping youth in atlanta whereas we might have circles in other places like birmingham and virginia and um also in Denver, we, we have circles all over the United States. And are these circles independent of or housed within like community foundations? Like I'll give you an example. I remember doing some fundraising in Kansas City. Mm -hmm. And one of the community foundations had like the African-American Community Fund. Do these tend to be aligned with organizations like that or independent of them? 
Sometimes um, my circle is is a, a donor advice fund. So we are not a 501c3. We are a donor advice fund under a foundation called Funds for Southern Community. Some circles are 501c3s. We have a uh, Cola Gives in South Carolina that is its own 501c3. We have others that are donor advice funds, and we have others that are partners with some of the foundations. So it really depends on how the circle wants to chart its own course. Understood. And is there a clearinghouse for the funds within the CIN, the Community Investment Network? Like if I wanted to access them, is there a place? So, we, so Community Investment Network is actually a 501c3 and we're a membership organization. So the circles actually are part of our network and we support them. That's what the purpose of Community Investment Network is. And we do that with actual conferences. We have conferences. We have leadership conferences. We have two um, signature programs, which is EDGE, which is Essentials and Diversity, which is a curriculum that actually is used to help exchange and identify and also teach foundations and organizations and universities and corporate companies about diversity. A lot of times they don't look at the African-American donor as a donor. It's oftentimes it's an invisible donor. So we teach on how to actually identify how to communicate, also elevate that this is a viable donor that you should look at. Because um, right now you're, you're looking at, um, you're, you have a, a lens that is definitely not is skewed because you're not looking at all the donors that you could. So we, use, we have that as one of our initiatives and also that we are a philanthropist initiative, which is a opportunity to help college students form giving circles. Uh, teach them the collective giving model so that, you know, in college, if they are looking at, hey, I don't have enough money to give back, but I want to give back. You look at this collective giving model where you take some of your friends, 10 of your friends, um, it could be a, a sorority or a fraternity where one of the lines want to give back, or it could be a, a club, a social club, or a sociology class. Um, but we go through the giving circle model that we have, the collective model, and show how adding your treasure and your time and your talent is very impactful to the community. And then also you're able to see it because you are right there with the community walking hand in hand. I love that. And I love that diversity is a real tenant in the work that you all do, not just the diversity by virtue of having people of color, particularly black people participate, right? I'm talking more or less the diversity of thought, right? Or the causes that are near and dear to us, that are in our communities and we see the risk factors. One thing that I'm reminded of is just how important it is to have a seat at that table and to have a voice at the table and be a decision maker. I shared with you that I worked in Atlanta. I actually started my nonprofit career in Atlanta. And I remember working with the United Way of Atlanta with their community investment network. I was a community investment volunteer and, and we had completed a pretty extensive training. And there was a sister heading up the CIV at that time, the community investment volunteer program. I think her name was Akila. I have no idea if she's still there. But anyway, I remember we were tasked with making funding determinations on behalf of the United Way Atlanta. And we had a slate of, I want to say, three to five applications from grantees that were, well, not grantees, applicants, I should say, that were vying for community investment dollars from the United Way Atlanta. And one of which was the Andrew Young YMCA mm -hmm. over on Campbellton Road. And I remember being in a meeting with the other CIV cohort members, and I remember being the only black female, the others were, they were non-black and, and white. There were a few white males, white females in the, in the cohort. And we were literally looking at the Andrew Young Center's application and deducing, you know, looking at their clients they served, looking at their impact and making a funding determination as to whether or not they should get the $500,000 that they were requesting, right? And they had volume. They served a big volume of students after school. You've seen it. And we know what our children, you know, they need a safe haven after school and a place to go and do homework. And I remember the topic of discussion was, okay, well, what can they cut? 
you know, would. And I remember saying, well, wait a minute. We see that this program is impactful. We see the span. We can justify the funding award, right? They've been a grantee for X number of years. And I essentially found myself defending why this organization should receive every penny of the money it was asking for and possibly more, considering the mantle that it had for serving students in Southwest Atlanta, right? Mm -hmm. And I remember being really, really fearful, like, you know what, what if I hadn't been here to do that and add that perspective? This could have gone a different way. And it was from that day that I remember feeling like, wow, you know, I've got to have some agency in these kinds of decisions, right? I've got to be an, an architect and, you know, feel like I have to defend worthy charitable causes serving black youth like me, right? That grew up or growing up the way that I grew up got to be a part of this. So I know that I've said a lot and I would like for you to react. Talk about how, like you say, ordinary people doing extraordinary things can really leverage these giving circles to do just that. So I often say, and we say in the Community Investment Network, that community knows what community needs. And when I say that, I mean, you know, by listening to the community, by being part of the community, by giving back to the community, uh, a lot of times people will, you know, have these preconceived notions. Oh, well, what will they do with the money? How will they use it? You know, questioning all, all these things, making black nonprofits jump through a lot of different hoops. We advocate and teach the trust-based philanthropy model. They have made it. They have worked. They have structured. They have done, you know, in your example, the kids are being served. Um, they are doing it probably with a lot less than some of the white-led nonprofits. So, you know, the trust-based philanthropy model is a true example of why we need to continue to give money and pour money into our communities um, without having them jump through so many different hoops. Because we have done it. We do that a lot in Community Investment Network with our circles, partner with, when the circles partners with organizations, we don't, you know, have them fill out, you know, multiple multiple papers, turn in all the white papers, you know, all of this. A lot of our funds, a lot of our circles give money um, and do it on a, not in a case where it's a hard situation, like you must do this, you must check this box, you must go through these grant cycles. Yes, there is structure. It is not just like willy-nilly, you get, you get some money, you get some money. But, you get a car. <laughs> you get a car, car, you get a car, right. Um, but a lot of our circles, most of our circles have unrestricted funds when we give. And that is really, really powerful because you look at a, a community center or a small grassroots nonprofit, they might be servicing youth, but they also have to keep the lights on. And in order to service the youth, they have to have lights. In order to do that, a lot of the grants that they get, maybe even from government funding, it's very, very, very much program specific. And it has to be earmarked for programs. Um, we're able to fill that niche, right? Because we know that, you know, things have to happen in the background. And a lot of these EDs are working themselves into the ground. Um, a lot of these workers who work for nonprofits are doing going above and beyond just to keep things going and keep their programs going. And when we have a voice at the table, because a lot of us are community leaders and or uh, advocates in our own way, like, like you were doing for the uh, Andrew Young YMCA at the time, we have to be able to speak to those things. We have to be able to showcase, hey, this is what's happening in these communities. And when, when those funds are not available, the giving circle are able to fill in those gaps. Um, and I am really excited about that because, you know, a lot of times there are some opportunities that are needed that we can help with, we can assist with, whether that is just giving our dollars or it is, you know, also advocating and sharing and promoting the organizations as well, or stepping in and being volunteers. That doesn't always happen with other organizations as they give back to, or they check a box because they help the black community. That's right. In doing this work, um, I know you've been involved for some time now. You, you talked about one of the misnomers about Blacks in philanthropy. When we hear about wealth, we think of the wealthy white male philanthropists. You think of the buildings with namesakes, right, at colleges and universities and the museums. Can you take a moment and talk to us about 
other misnomers you might have heard about Blacks in philanthropy? Like, I want to debunk some of these myths. Well, I think that, you know, a lot of times people assume that we are not giving back. We give back as a Black community more than anybody else. We give back to our churches. We give back to our communities in various ways. Um, And, you know, as philanthropists, uh, people of color, African-Americans, particularly because of churches, and that is a philanthropic piece, we give back the most. And you would think, hey, I don't have a big check, so I can't give back. But collectively, we've seen it. We've seen organizations change. We've seen people change. We've seen people's lives change. And the impact is very, very important. A lot of times, the narrative is only told by the storyteller. And we don't oftentimes tell our story because we're too busy doing the work. Um, I think that if we have the opportunity to showcase and tell our story, um, you will be able to see lots of impact and who it impacts and how it impacts. That might be someone who was not available or did not have the means to go to college and now they're in college. That might be a small um, boys basketball team who now can go to the national championship for those little things that we do at the church where we pass the plate. Or it could be systemic change where you look at Black Voters Matter and how we change the, I mean, Georgia is a great, I mean, I'm here. So I, I can see how things changed in the last, you know, 12 months with Stacey Abrams' teams knocking on doors, being very intentional, being strategic in their reach and calling people out, right? Asking the right questions, pushing the envelope a little bit. Um, but when we come together as community, we can see that. Um, And we've been coming together as community for a very long time as Black people. We've done that prior to the Civil Rights Movement, but there are different in philanthropic history where if you look at the history books, you may not see us, but we're all the way through there. There is, we could talk about, you know, cultural things back to Africa, um, that where we have always been a lover of mankind and humankind and given back in that way, which is the basis of uh, philanthropy. It's in our DNA. It's in our DNA. I agree. It's in our DNA. It's our heritage. It's who we are as a people. And I'm reminded of my humble beginnings. And when people would go to college and you would see that aunt and a couple of other aunts and that godmother say, okay, well, how are we going to get Ronette through college? This is how we're going to do it. When they made that box and, and packed the quilts and packed mm-hmm. the snacks, and they put a little money here and there aside and pooled it and blessed Renette in her college journey. Because although they hadn't attended, maybe didn't have the opportunity to go to college, this was an important goal, an important achievement. That's happening, right? Every day. Every day. Every day. How do people connect with the giving circles? So um, the Community Investment Network, we have a presence on the web. You can go to www.thecommunityinvestment.org and learn more about our our network. Even if you want to start a giving circle, if you're interested in starting a giving circle, learn a little bit more about the collective giving model that we've had over the last 16 years. If you're interested in any of our signature programs, you can go there and find us. And then you can click on our social media. Of course, uh, we're on Facebook, Instagram, and um, Twitter. So all of that can be found on our base page to connect and link up with us. For the different circles are actually located on there as well. So my circle in Atlanta, Georgia is listed there. um, And we also have presence on Facebook too. We are Circle of Joy ATL. So I love it. And you have partnered with Microsoft in a really, really great way. Please tell the good people listening about this exciting partnership between the Circle of Joy and Microsoft. Well, it's actually between CIN, but since I'm in it, we, we all, it's the whole family. So the Community Investment Network has um, had the opportunity to partner with Microsoft where we're in a um, Black nonprofit uh, accelerator where they literally have provided resources and services to help with the technical divide. Because we are a giving circle, we wanted to give to our community. We wanted them to have the same experience that we had. Um, And this is a relationship where you can have software and tools and training that will assist you for several years, for 10 years. And so we're going to have an actual webinar very soon um, on the 7th of April. Um, at 2 p.m. And that is actually on our website, too. So if you go to the Community Investment Network's website, which is the communityinvestment.org, and go to the 
you can click on CIN plus Microsoft, the power of the collective. We will talk about that experience, how you too can have that um, onboarding and have those tools. Um, We want black nonprofits to be able to thrive in this time because we work so hard and we're servicing our communities. There are ways to work smarter and not harder. And um, other organizations and other groups have had these opportunities and have a couple of leg ups on us in in that area. We want to make sure that we can change that. We can see and have templates and trainings and tools that will help us um, go further together. And Microsoft has been um, a great partner in that and wanting to be intentional about how they actually help with that. So this is one of the things that we're excited about and we're excited to share with communities, Black communities all across the United States. So we hope that everybody can join us. Maybe we can put a flyer up at the end to give them access to it. But also, um, you can always go to the communityinvestment.org and go to the Power of the Collective. Click on that link and it'll be a a place where you can sign up there. Okay, so here's what I want to do for the good people listening. We got a resource available. Microsoft Premium. I want to make it real plain for the good people listening. This is an opportunity for, and this is for Black led nonprofits. Is that yep. right? Black led nonprofits helping Black communities. Helping Black communities. You can access Microsoft Office 365, get a premium license. Get several premium licenses. Several yes. at no cost. No cost. 10 years. Incredible. So and I- other access to other tools, you know, when we think about it, Microsoft owns a lot of software, a lot of products. So this is an opportunity for us to be able to plug and play, get the, the tools that we need, and then also build a relationship with Microsoft yourself. We know that they have coins. <laughs> so <What>? um, <laughs> let's make sure that they don't forget us in this situation. What um, my goal is, is to impact over a thousand communities, black communities with this actual partnership. And then also make sure that Microsoft understands that we are here and your dollars can be spent for us to continue to help our communities. That's right. Don't get it twisted. So the good people listening, in order to make good on this, to take advantage, they need to register Mm -hmm. and attend the webinar. Right. That's it. It's really simple. It's not a hard ask. But if you can do that, then we will be able to uh, provide the services to you as well. You will have the same services that we have. You will have the opportunity to be able to connect with Microsoft. They will give you an actual concierge where they'll talk about what what issues do you have. And then they'll give you some steps on how you can how they can help you and assist you in the tools that you need and what tools might work best for your organization. Oh, I already got some questions for them. <laughs> so I've, and I've secured, look, I've secured my seat for that. Yeah. And I also wanted the opportunity. We wanted community to have opportunity to talk to Microsoft. We understand that black communities and black nonprofits oftentimes get caught with the gotcha moment. What, what is, what, what they got, what they doing so that what do they need from me? Um, we want it. It'll be an opportunity for us to talk as community to um, Microsoft and ask the questions. Ask the questions that you want to know so that, you know, you can understand what this is and understand that they are committed to uh, being better and doing better. That's right. I love that. Thank you for orchestrating this, Joy. This is going to be very beneficial to people that are doing some really, really phenomenal work. You've you've listened to the Black Fundraisers podcast. You know, we get to the bonus questions portion of the interview where we get a little personal. You ready to get personal with us? Sure. sure. Why not? This is the fun part. Okay. Yeah. The fun part. I want to know when things return to some semblance of normalcy, even though in Atlanta, it looked like it's been open for a real long time there. We never put the light out. (laughs) It seemed like it's been on all the way live for a little while there now, you know. Uh, But anyway, I ain't going to talk about that. I'm not going to go there. But I I do want to say this, um, you know, when you're comfortable kind of moving around, what's one of the first things you look forward to doing? Oh, I'm I'm going to Aruba. I mean, I'm getting on a plane. I'm I'm going away. Um, I love my town and I love my home, and I've been blessed to be in it and of it and um, get real close to it. But I'm I'm ready to see something different. So uh, Aruba is one of my favorite destinations. So I think I'll be traveling there. 
I love a Reuben. Unless the Lord says otherwise, because sister got vaccinated. You know, <laughs> sister got that first shot. I got to get the second one and see how that works out. Um, you know, a sister might have to book a trip and, and go over there as well. It's a beautiful. I hear you. I hear you. Love it there. What are you doing for self-care these days? Sometimes vegging out on a series on Netflix uh, that I haven't seen, taking walks and connecting with friends. Um, you know, as you said, Atlanta doesn't necessarily close, um, but we've been able to do some, you know, to, to stay connected, whether that's just taking the time. You know, we work so hard. Um, and it seems like although people say, oh, I'm working from home, it's, there are no off hours. So just really plugging and, and unplugging, taking the time to unplug, whether that is walking, meeting with friends, and therapy. I mean, I don't think that there can be enough said for therapy. Um, Black Talk folks, think of it as a, as a mis, misnomer, but it is, it is something that is, is very valuable for our community, especially Black women. I have had the opportunity to talk to a lot of leaders in this space, and there is a lot on our shoulders. We as Black people put a lot on our shoulders. So we need to be able to release two healthy ways. So that those would be my self-care top five. Yeah, those are great, great um, self-care. And I'm hearing some themes. There's a lot of similarities between what you shared and what some of the other sisters that have visited the Black Fundraisers podcast have to share. What's on your playlist? Oh, I really am jamming to Jasmine Sullivan's new album. It what? Pick up your feelings? Everything. Yes, it is everything. Her is great. Silk Sonic with Bruno is is amazing. Um, and then I'm from Atlanta, so I always have Outkast and anything done with family is always there. I, I'm truly ATL, so I'm going to have a little T.I., a little Jeezy, some Gucci. Hey. And I went to school in FAM, so I got a little Florida in there, too. So it is versatile. And because we are Black people, we are all versatile. Um, so yes. we can we can get 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 right and cool down at the same time. So um, that's what's on my playlist right now. I love it because you're right. We are versatile people. We can go to, you know, James Cleveland. We can. Say everybody. I can go from James Cleveland to T.I., you know, uh, Trap music album. I'm really excited to um, know a sister like you that's doing the work that you're doing to drive meaningful social change. I mean, it's I'm just in awe. I just love everything about, you know, how fearless we are and unabashed you know, about bringing forth our good ideas you know, in the spirit of community, I, I think that that narrative needs to be told more. You know, the unsung women like like you and the Stacey Abrams of the world, I mean, that are getting it done. So I celebrate you. Yeah, and I, thank you so very much. I celebrate you for bringing us together and just the work. Like everybody is working really hard and our communities are working really hard to do different things. And um, I always say we may not be in the same boat, we may not have the same message, but we can all move forward together and get get there together. We just have to do something. We have to stand up. We have to be available. Um, the community investment network and the giving circles in our network are doing something for their community. They're not sitting on the sidelines. They're saying, what well, I want to do this intentionally. I want to do this strategically. I want to do this collectively with people who think like me. We want the same goals. We want to better our communities. So these are the unsung heroes, the everyday people doing extraordinary things. Um, love the opportunity to partner um, with you and all the great work that you're doing. So thank you for having me. Thank you. Well, I want to thank you, Joy, for stopping by the Black Fundraisers podcast. Thanks for rocking out with me today. I want to thank the good people listening. As I always say, I do not take it lightly to the good folks listening. You could be anywhere in the world in the internet streets. And I'm humbled that you're tuning in with me from week to week. I want to let you know next week, I'm sounding off. You will not want to miss. We will be talking to voter mobilization groups in the state of Georgia out there fighting a the good fight to protect the black and brown vote. We will have both pro-Georgia and Black Voters Matters to join us and let us know what they're doing to defend and energize the minority vote there on the ground, um, despite Governor Kemp's efforts to 
disenfranchise black and brown voters all across the state of Georgia. So make sure you tune in to that. And as I say, be kind to yourself, take care of yourself, stay tuned, stay down, and we'll be back with you next week. Keep your head up. Thanks for listening to the Black Fundraisers podcast. Like what you're hearing? Subscribe to the Black Fundraisers podcast on Apple Podcast, Spotify, or wherever you listen, and leave a five-star review. Connect with Kia on LinkedIn, Instagram, and Twitter to stay connected. Hello, thanks so much for stopping by. I am Kia Kroon, and I'm a fundraising professional and DEI champion. I am in pursuit of racial justice for people of color and communities of color. I'd love to explore ways we can work together to change the world. 